You're listening and watching Rashkin Report. My name is Yuri Rashkin. On today's program, War in Ukraine. Since 2014, when Russia began its war of aggression against the Ukraine, it is the people of Ukraine, the civilians, who have been caught in the crossfires of this war. My two guests today are going to tell us about what is going on, why are people being swept up, and what is being done and what can be done to get these civilians who have been arrested to return back home um, many of these people have not been able to communicate with their families in years. And in fact, my second guest, Marina Schiffer, only is aware of her father still being alive because some witnesses have emerged who spent time with him in the jail cell and since being released have been able to verify that he is still alive. My first guest is Alexandra Matvichuk, who is the leader of the Civil Liberties Center in Kiev, Ukraine, an organization dedicated to helping return civilian prisoners back home. My second guest is Marina Schiffer, who lives in Germany, but connected with us from Kiev, Ukraine. She is looking to get her father released from prison, where he has been detained after being swept up in 2017. Let's welcome them to the program and hear their stories. Alexandra Matvichuk, thank you so much for joining us. If you could say a little bit about your organization that you are representing here today. The Center for Civil Liberties is Ukrainian human rights organization. One of the main direction of our work is uh, assisting in process of releasing of political prisoners. Uh, in Russia and occupied Crimea, as well as uh, prisoners of the war and civil hostages in occupied Donbas. Can you tell us a little bit about any numbers, either number of people detained or number of people released? Um, can you tell us anything like that? Um, we have to say about several categories of people. The first group of people is people who are detained for political motives in Russian occupied Crimea. Why I said uh, uh, about these uh, people as a separate group? Because Russia recognized their jurisdiction and recognized that these people are jailed. In our list, uh, we have 103 such kind of people. Majority of them is Crimean Tatar, the indigenous uh, people from peninsula. Second group is uh, prisoners of the war and uh, civil hostages, uh, which are detained in occupied Donbas. Uh, the, according to official numbers of uh, Ukrainian state bodies, uh, we know only the uh, number uh, 251. But um, based on my uh, personal work as a human rights defender, I must uh, say that the real number is much higher and this number is only the top of iceberg. We don't know how much people are detained illegally in the secret place of detention in the Donbas. Do you have um, any, uh, well, are there success stories? <sighs> The war is going on for seven years already, and uh, unfortunately, the success stories uh, which we have uh, then uh, changed for the new arrests uh, and new prosecution in occupied territories. But the most bright success stories is releasing of Ukrainian film producer Alexei Sov. Our organization started a campaign which is called Save Alexei Sov, uh, Global Action. And we united public group and uh, active people in 40 countries of the world. Uh, we started the practice of parallel uh, public demonstration in, in capital of 40 countries of the world with a demand to their national government. And we started this campaign uh, as a response when Alexei Sov uh, initiated hunger strike with his famous uh, demand to release all political prisoners. Uh, to make this uh, long story short, I must admit that uh, in that fact that uh, 7 of September 2019, Alexei Sov and 
30 four other Ukrainian political prisoners returned home uh, from Russia was a huge input of uh, hundreds and hundreds of people around the world who joined to this campaign and who make this uh, problem visible. All right, that actually points to two things, well, several. Um, um, first of all, Alexensov was held in Russia. He was not held in any part of Ukraine. I think he was held in Russia. And so are you saying that most of the people who you're trying to re get released are actually being held in Russia? And um, that release of Alexensov and 34 people, I believe you said, um, that was one time negotiation kind of special occasion. And there are hundreds, if not thousands of people that are probably detained. I mean, there was, you know, war going on there. Mm -hmm. um, do you have any information on whether these people are alive that, that you know? It's, uh, um, I will answer for the first and second question. Of course. Uh, I, I would like to draw your attention that Alexin Sov was arrested in Crimea, as well as many other people were arrested in Crimea and then illegally transferred to Russia. It's a violation of international humanitarian law because occupying state couldn't move people from the occupied territory to the, their native territory. But we know that Alexin Sov was transferred to the most uh, far from cold place in Russian Federation, which is called Labetnangi, uh, from former peninsula near sea to the frozen, um, from frozen um, temperature with a very low, low degrees. Right, uh, where, where Russia sends its own best people, yes. yes. Um, and uh, so that's, yeah, so he's definitely, like I said, I mean, I was participated, I participated in several different actions to release Alex and Sof. I have a t-shirt signed by Masha Alokina from Pussy Riot, you know, to, to release Alex and Sof, but he was definitely in Russia. So all of these people that we're going, that we're discussing today, most of them you expect to find in Russian prisons? Uh, is, uh, we speak about two groups. Okay. The first group is um, political prisoners. And um, Russia, sooner or later, transfers them from Crimea to different regions of Russia. But when we speak about uh, prisoners of the war and civil hostages, mostly of them are on the occupied territories and still remains there. It's uh, like exception. For example, we have a case of Alexander Marchenko, who, who was arrested in Donetsk and then transferred to Russia and, uh, and jailed in Russia. But it's exception. Uh, the majority of these people uh, are still remains in the uh, different place of detention in uh, in Donbas, in occupied Donbas, which is under control of Russia. That's why all this negotiation, uh, uh, which Ukrainian government provide, are provided with Russian side. All right, and then I guess uh, the final question: uh, What do you feel? Um, listeners, viewers uh, of this program, programs such as this can do to help the situation? Uh, first, uh, to answer to this question, I would like to uh, name the three goals why Russia uses these people, for what they detain these people. Uh, the first reason for, for Russia to detain these people is to create, uh, is to use uh, these people as an instrument in informational war, because they name these people like extremists, terrorists, uh, spies, uh, etc. And um, in the hybrid war which Russia uh, lead against Ukraine, uh, there is a very important informational um, part, and uh, these uh, people. Um, using like a, a tool to create image of enemy. Second goal uh, is uh, that is a method how to conduct it war itself. Uh, because uh, the uh, victims of the persecution become um, in, in majority cases, uh, the uh, people who are non-loyal to occupied power uh, for example, journalists, human rights defenders, civil activists, people who um, took part in uh, pro-Ukrainian meetings on the beginning of occupation, etc. 
and that's why uh, such kind of prosecution uh, provide uh, a, a, like two signals. The first signal uh, is attempt to physically liquidate or um, uh, move or push people go away from this territory. This uh, act, uh, this active minority and second signal is a signal to passive majority to keep calm. So it's a tool how to quickly obtain the control over the region. And third uh, goals, uh, Russia use uh, this illegally detained people like a bargain uh, issue in negotiation, like a blackmail in order to push Ukraine uh, to uh, fulfill the political demand. That's why, uh, in order to release these people, Russia asks different things like, um, like um, release of the uh, key witness of uh, tragedy of MH17, to uh, change Ukrainian constitution, to organize election in occupied uh, Donbas, uh, to provide water to Crimea and other things. So um, it's uh, it's like we have in order to to um, evaluate what we can do in this situation, we need to understand the real goal and how Russia use this uh, so-called exchange fund. It's not good to name people like exchange fund, but in fact uh, they used like this. And what has to be done uh, in this regard? Uh, we have uh, um, a, a list of recommendation. I can send it later, but. Uh, all this recommendation divided into groups uh, and I will start with groups uh, which uh, help people to be alive until the um, moment of release because uh, people are tortured, uh, people have no medical care, people are deprived of basic rights, kept in the whole isolation. For example, I myself interviewed more than 100 uh, uh, people who released from captivity and I spoke with people who were beaten, raped, smashed into wooden boxes, whose fingers were cut, whose eyes were pulled out with spoon. So uh, the, the first set of recommendations is about to stop this practice of torturing, uh, to provide a free access to International Committee of Red Cross to this place of detention, uh, to um, have a guarantee of basic medical care, which is especially important in situation of pandemia, and other uh, recommendation which, Ukra which Ukrainian authorities and international community have to demand from Russian side. And second recommend bunch of recommendation is about how to push Russia to release finally all these people without these political demands. And this is a good question. Uh, it's a, uh, it needs a complex strategy, and uh, it's it's a long uh, conversation. But uh, this strategy has to be based on the uh, keeping uh, constant uh, attention to this uh, to this uh, uh, problem and organizing hearings in um, American Parliament or um, different on, on other political levels. Um, or discussions, or, uh, or um, even um, series of interview uh, will help uh, to uh, not lose this issue from the agenda. Um, Alexander Matichuk, thank you so much for joining us today, and thank you for all this information, and good luck in your important work. Thank you very much. Um, next, I'm excited to welcome to the program Marina Schiffer, who is also part of uh, the group uh, that we're speaking with today, uh, working to get her father released, along with other prisoners of war uh, for Russia against Ukraine. That's been going on since 2014. Um, and uh, Marina, welcome to the program. Uh, hello, Yuri. Thank you for, for the opportunity to talk to you today and to everyone who can hear this program. I'm very Absolutely. glad to, 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 uh, to explain my situation and to, um, share, to share my, my story with you. Thank you so much. I, I really appreciate it, and as do our listeners and viewers. Um, first, if you could uh, describe what happened with your dad, and then we will talk about uh, the work that you have done since to bring attention to, yeah. uh, frankly, torture and, and other injustices that are, are occurring with prisoners. So first about your father. Yeah, the war came into our life in 2014. I'm not the only one who 
who had such problems. Uh, we all were forced to leave our homes um, just from one day to another. We were not allowed to uh, be Ukrainian anymore. Uh, we were we were first forced to uh, leave our homes on, and to find a new place to stay. Uh, it's more than one and a half millions uh, um, people who was forced to leave. Uh, um, um, everyone, everyone had some families or some contacts there and was forced to uh, keep in touch with those people. And uh, the story that happened to my father started this way. He uh, went to uh, visit his uh, mother, my grandmother, um, and uh, to try to take her out uh, from that uh, situation. And he could not uh, return. He got lost. We've been looking for him since three years. Uh, there was a moment that we lost the hope to find him, but uh, um, uh, people who came out uh, of of that uh, secret jails where where he is till now, uh, they could tell us uh, that they uh, they have seen them and they could prove that he's still there and he's still alive. So we have a great hope that one day he will come out. Um, what what makes you sure what makes you feel confident that after three years in in the jail that really isn't a jail, but it's more some kind of facility that's not designed to hold people. Um, what makes you feel optimistic that your father, for instance, uh, could be, still be alive? Well, uh, I know my father and I, I hope that uh, he's still uh, strong, strong enough to go through those situations. Um, and I know, um, I mean, everyone, I guess, in, in this planet has a special connection with, with his uh, family. And I feel right now that he's still alive and I'm sure that he wants me to fight for his life. And that's give me a hope. Uh, more than that, uh, I don't need even. I mean, uh, that's enough for me. Do, uh, when we uh, spoke earlier, you mentioned that your father is uh, like an electrician. And so you feel hopeful that perhaps that is one of the reasons that um, he, he's still there. Um, yes, they, they are using him there. Uh, he helps, uh, he works there. So um, I have a hope that uh, until they use him, they need him. Uh, so probably um, there is an information that he helped there uh, in those jails, he helped there. So uh, maybe, maybe that's why the, uh, he's still alive. Last information that he's alive, we got in uh, December 2019. I mean, we don't have an uh, information about 2020, so it's very hard to say what is happening right now. But last information was that he used to help there, and that's why he's still alive. How, um, what, what have you done since uh, his arrest to uh, bring more attention and visibility to uh, both his case and others uh, that are in, in this condition? Uh, you know, it's hundreds, if not thousands of people. Yeah, at the beginning of my private situation three years ago, I tried the, every legal way to solve this problem, uh, to take him out of there. Uh, at some mo moment of time, I lost my hope and I was very disappointed. So I start my uh, my second war, let's say, and I'm very active right now. I'm taking a part in the conferences. For example, last uh, conference that I took a part in, it was in Berlin. Uh, in November 2020, I mean, not very long time ago, uh, I talked there about, I, I, um, I was uh, uh, telling there about uh, um, civil hostages uh, that are in, in Don, Donbass region, region right now and uh, the uh, secret jails uh, uh, and what the people are going through um, in those jails. So uh, we, uh, we are also... Um, taking part in a lot of uh, um, also official work. We are supporting our uh, our politicians uh, uh, by, by sharing, uh, I mean, we are sharing our information and sharing, um, trying to uh, unite us uh, in this fight. So um, actually we are, we are uh, pleased to uh, talk to um, different uh, politicians here in Ukraine. Um, we are also connecting with, uh, we're connected with uh, different uh, people who are living uh, out of Ukraine, but uh, uh, they can help us with the situation. So uh, actually they're that... doing a lot of, a lot of things uh, to uh, inform people about. And this uh, program right now is a great proof that uh, we are uh, knocking on every door 
How are you seeing the situation change in 2020 because of COVID? Um, is there's, I, I would imagine in a war zone, there is not much medications available. Yeah, let's say our, our uh, situation been ignored uh, and that's not the only uh, not the only problem that been ignored right now um, uh, the situation with covid-19 uh, is the most important topic um, of course it's very hard to um, tell our stories to the world because no one simply want to hear it but we don't want to lose a hope because it's about lives of our our relatives so we don't have a choice. And even, even uh, we know how hard it is right now to uh, reach somebody's mind, we are still trying to do that. But do of course, we know what is, what is COVID and we all are uh, uh, informed how hard right now to meet each other, how hard to communicate and how hard to uh, fight against such problems. Do you feel that Ukrainian officials are able to do something to help you or have you found them to be not, you know, not able to help you and, and do they yeah, want to say, help you? Yeah, yeah. Let's say they are trying to help us. Of course, we can feel it. But that's the most uh, important thing that they are trying to do it in a legal way. What can you do against the person who stands in front of you with a weapon? What can you tell him? Which paper you can show him? There is no document against the weapon. So um, everything what our uh, country is trying to do is they try to uh, work legally. And that's normal for a legal country uh, as, uh, like Ukraine to uh, act legally. But uh, uh, that's what I want to say once again. You can't act legally against someone who has a weapon and can kill you. Uh, no need of documents. So it's like unfair. The fight that they make uh, is very hard for them. So without uh, without the uh, help of the community, the, the, the whole world, uh, we can do nothing against uh, Kremlin. And you are, you are not fighting this um, battle alone. You are working with other families in similar situation. Can you talk a little bit about that? What that's like, uh, you know, when you have a group of people in the same or similar situation, uh, is it possible to work together or does everyone feel that their situation is different and do they want to keep things private, public? How does that work? Um, yeah, it's uh, sometimes it's hard to unite people. Sometimes it's easy. It depends from the situation. Let's say someone uh, is sim they are scared to do something to not to. Um, I mean, the, the people who uh, took them to this jail, they are also watching internet, they are uh, also well informed in everything what is happening, so they are simply scared that something can happen to their uh, relatives. So many of them, they keep mouths shut and they try to uh, um, try to wait and uh, just to, to expect some miracle to happen. Uh, we can't uh, do that anymore and we are looking for people and we are uniting with the people who are ready to act, ready to talk openly about these problems because we don't find another way to solve it. I'm talking right, I'm speaking English because I've studied it. I'm living in Germany right now. I know how to use Zoom. I know how to use a computer. I know how to communicate with the with society. Let's say not everyone uh, would do that because uh, actually Donetsk and Lugansk uh, regions, they are not that, uh, let's say uh, we have a case right now uh, and the grandmother is fighting for uh, for the grandchild um, he's uh, more than three years, three and a half years in jail right now. Uh, and this grandmother, she can't simply use an email. Uh, what, what, what she can do in this world to, to be heard? Uh, actually nothing. So uh, of course they uh, try to unite with people like, like Larissa, like me, who could talk about this, who could open this information, especially in this COVID situation, because um, no one flies, no one meets each other, no one talk about this, yeah? So of course we represent those people and we, we personally uh, want, want everyone to get out of there, not only our relatives. Yeah? So we are open and we are there for the people who can do it by themselves. Uh, we are open to help them. Of how, many people, how many people are you working with? How many families are you trying to help working together? Versus yeah, right how many people do you think there are versus how many people there are in uh, the missing that are basically missing? 
uh, it's very hard to say right now. There is a, uh, officially, officially, uh, we have 200, uh, uh, 51 person there, but a lot of them are missed, uh, so they are not in the that list. That seems like a very small, not... unrealistic number. Yeah, that's, 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 uh, that's exactly the problem, because this those cases are proved that those people are there, and it's just like uh, 2% uh, from 100. So a lot of them are just missed. They are gone. They are disappeared. They are not there. No one knows where they are. And it's you can't compare those numbers with 250 because 250 is just the legal proved cases, let's say. Well, um, yeah. what can people do to help? What can, uh, you know, because you, you're working on, I think, on, on two levels. You're trying to attract political attention, but then you're also just trying to raise awareness overall. So let's say I'm watching this and I'm learning a lot from you telling you're sharing your story. Now I want to do something. What what can what can I do if I, if I live you know somewhere outside of Ukraine, somewhere in the Western world, and and I want to help? Yeah, um, uh, we are having an information war right now. Um, um, is this information war started long time ago. It didn't start right now or in 2014. I mean, the information, the, the war that the uh, Russian Federation started against uh, uh, Ukraine um, was started before, before the open uh, aggression against our country. So the, the most important thing that everyone can do from their side is to be informed and to be informed in the right way. I'm not saying that my point of view is the, the, the rightest point of view, but I'm telling, could you please check the information and just take a look at those things are, that are happening right now in my country. Just take a look. You would find your own answers. You can analyze it by yourself. You don't have to listen to my point of view, but just look at that because the only hope that we have is that someone in this world will hear us. Because the politicians, they can do nothing against the weapon. Marina Schiffer, thank you so much for sharing your story and uh, for educating us uh, on what's going on in Ukraine. Thank you so much. Best of luck. Thank you. I would like to thank today's guests uh, for being on the program, but more importantly, for the very important work that they do to help reunite families in Ukraine. It is their concern and it is their hope that only political leaders of the West, as well as the civil society in the West, is able to influence the situation and to help their loved ones return home. So what we can do is we can listen to their story, we can share it, and we can try to bring it to the attention of our political leaders, because that is how a solution is going to be reached in Ukraine that is going to create peace. And so it is up to me and you and all of us to bring change to this world, including a not so little country in Eastern Europe called Ukraine. You've been listening and watching Rashkin Report. My name is Yuri Rashkin. Thank you for watching.